largely new faces, welcome. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this series, why we host it here in the library, and what we're going to be discussing today. So my name is Kimberly, and I'm one of the reference librarians here in the library. Um, this event is hosted weekly by the Seattle Central Library because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. So, while you may not agree with every single thing you read on our shelves or find our databases or even find in the items that I uh, put up here, we want everyone to be able to learn from a wide range of people things. So, the same philosophy is expressed by providing this space. And all points of view are welcome. And I'm going to ask that everyone remain respectful of everyone else's opinion and keep this a safe space. So, if you look for the front, you're going to see some resources that I put up those are all available for checkout. So if after the session you'd like to learn more about the topic that we're discussing today, feel free to browse and take those up from the circulation desk. And at the end of this discussion, I'm going to ask that you all fill out a brief survey telling me what you like, what you didn't like, what we could do better. We want this to remain an engaging and educational experience for everyone. So next week, Weston Brewer will be discussing diversity and ableism at Seattle Central College. But today, I want to introduce Joanne Factor as we discuss framing violence, the public life of domestic abuse. So Joanne has been teaching safety and self-defense for over 18 years, and as the owner and instructor at Strategic Living LLC, a personal safety and self-defense training, she's worked with middle-aged and older-age women concerned with going out and about, younger women looking to travel and date, healthcare workers concerned about giving their best while staying safe on home visits, girls off to college, girls navigating school, High school and middle school girls wanting to babysit and take buses by themselves. Female veterans dealing with chronic PTSD. Abused women looking to make safer choices. LGBTQ folks wanting to keep our community safer. Homeless women and women in transitional and low income housing. She's a volunteer advocate for Dawn, the only agency in South King County providing ser services to domestic violence survivors. Joanne's expertise has been featured on Hero Channel 7 TV. Q13's Washington Most Wanted, KUOW's 94.9 FM, and the Seattle Times Magazine. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, Joanne holds a BA from Cornell University of Black Belt and Karate, and was named Seattle's Best Feminist Butt Kicker in 2007 <laughs> by the Seattle Weekly. She's also the author of the forthcoming book, Self-Defense 101, What Every Woman Absolutely Positively Needs to Know for Her Own Safety. Joanne. Thank you. So this might be kind of a dangerous thing to confess to, but I'm not a football fan. <laughs> I don't yell, yeah, go Hawks! I mean, they're fine. I don't have anything against them. I'm just not a fan. Anybody here a fan? <laughs> okay, so there's, there's a few of you, okay? But I'm not going to get like run over by a mob. Thank goodness. Now, that's kind of, to me, that's kind of interesting because what started off this whole interest for me was actually began with the Seahawks. Okay? It began back in like April. And in April, or whenever the Seahawks, whenever the draft is, the Seahawks drafted a young man named Frank Clark. Is anyone familiar with that name? Okay, maybe he hasn't done a whole lot of playing. But they drafted a guy named Frank Clark to play for them. And that's fine. He seemed to be a decent enough player. But then it kind of came out he had a little run-in with the law. Okay, and the little run-in had to do with domestic violence. Apparently, I see some people nodding. They might have read about this way back in, in April, late April, early May. Okay, is anyone familiar with that? No? Okay. So basically, the police came to a hotel. They had been called, and um, basically, Frank Clark's then girlfriend was unconscious on the floor, or had been unconscious on the floor. And there was some kind of fight, and the girlfriend's family was in a room nearby, and several of her younger siblings had seen an altercation. And the police report basically you know, detailed some of the altercation aspects. Um, eventually, the um, prosecutor 
did not prosecute any criminal cases, and he was, um, the young man was suspended from his college football team for the remainder of the year, and he, and he was remanded to take classes on how to have a healthy relationship. And normally most people wouldn't care except apparently Pete Carroll, does anyone know who Pete Carroll is? Okay, yeah, he kind of coaches the Seahawks. Him and the team manager basically had come out and said they would not bring an abuser on board their team. And so that, that is kind of interesting. And then there was this, in the press, there was this fuss. And since nobody remembers it, that shows how powerful the press is for making a fuss. So it was kind of interesting that Pete Carroll, that after all this came out, that, well, yeah, he was basically had knocked out his girlfriend. Another football player apparently had done that. Anyone remember Ray Rice? Okay. And he got a suspension, and his suspension was then at least partially overturned. Okay. And so what I keep wondering is why the same scenario seems to happen over and over and over and over again. And then you have a fuss in the news, and people speak out against it. And then it gets quiet. And then another event happens, and then there's a lot of fuss against, oh, this is a bad thing, horrible, we can't let it play for us. In Pete Carroll's case, um, they said, we did a thorough investigation. And we came to the conclusion, we, in we interviewed everybody. And apparently everybody included um, Frank Clark's former coach, Frank Clark's um, former teammates on his college team, did not include the woman who was allegedly knocked out, did not include any of her younger siblings who had apparently seen the event, and did not include the police officer. So this kind of brings up a question of a new definition of what everybody really means when you're doing an investigation. Okay. Now, at the risk of kind of sounding like Donald Rumsfeld from the former president's administration, Donald Rumsfeld said that we know what we know. There are some things we know and we know we know them. And there are things that we know we don't know. But then there are also the unknown unknowns. And I'm going to add to that. There are also the I don't want to know unknowns. And these are the things that are unknown that you tell yourself, I just don't want to know. And I keep thinking about why does the same stuff happen over and over again? And why do we hear, yes, a complete investigation is going to happen, but it's not. And how do we talk about abusive relationships? And why did this young woman choose not to press charges? In fact, why do so many people in abusive relationships choose not to press charges? Anyone want to volunteer any guesses why you might not want to press charges? Yes? Perhaps they, perhaps they have a battered woman syndrome. Okay. Which they believe is just that they are going through the cycle of violence that can be used, or maybe they're too scared to come forward for fear of what they will do to them or their family or friends they care about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's two good reasons. Okay, so the battered woman syndrome is just like it's a phase, something they love to grow. It doesn't happen all the time. As and then the other one that you contrasted is is the fear of they'll do this again if I tell the police and they go to jail for a week or two or three and then they come out and then they're really going to you know, do something even worse. Okay. Um, good, any other reasons? Anyone think of? Yes. Part of the psychological trauma includes an extreme dependence on the abuser often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so sometimes you can feel that you're very dependent on it. Some, and sometimes it's not only psychological, sometimes it's very, very visceral, sometimes it's very physical, sometimes it's very financial. Okay. Um, 
I do volunteer work for Don in South King County. And a number of the clients who come to Don, basically one of the hallmarks of abusive relationships, at least long-term abusive relationships, is the abuser controls all the finances, controls the money. So it makes it actually really challenging to leave. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Um, I was gonna say another reason why they might not press charges is because just going through the legal system can be like really traumatic and it's actually not set up to help survivors and a lot of times mm -hmm. when uh, the physical survivors are actually taken instead of the abuser. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that a survivor could be arrested? Yes. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's one thing that's really important to know domestic violence. And this is a law in Washington state. If there's, if the police come to a domestic violence call and there's signs that there's been physical violence within the prior four hours, it's the job of the police to figure out who is the primary aggressor and arrest at least one person. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes not so much. So that's it's a really important point. And also, um, yes, the legal justice system is really not user friendly. It's really not set up for people who aren't well versed in the law to navigate through it. So one thing I really advocate for people who've been in abusive relationships want to use a legal system is either get an attorney or find a legal advocate from an organization like in the Seattle area, New Beginnings, or in South King County, Don on the east side, Live Wire. But a legal advocate will actually help you go through the process. So there's also a few other reasons um, that I think would be important in this case, is that this young woman actually cared about the guy and didn't want to see his career ruined. And that's, that's a very important, that's a very important one. And you see that actually in a lot of places. A lot of people say, gee, if I press charges, this person is gonna get fired. And that's not so good. Okay, because I'm still financially dependent on this person. They're gonna get fired, they'll lose their pension. And in this guy's case, in Frank Clark's case, he might not get to play pro ball. And she didn't want that to happen. A lot of people, there's a reason you've been with this abuser, you really care about them, you're in love with them often. Okay. So, one thing is how do we talk about domestic violence? How do we think about it? And one thing we really like to do, what is this? This is a box. Okay, it's a really simple box, very simple. And it's so simple, we like to put people in the box. Okay, so let's say we'll call this box right now the domestic violence survivor. When you hear the phrase domestic violence survivor, what words, would, what picture pops in your head? Yes. You think of a female. Hmm? Okay. So you think of somebody who's female. Yes. Um, yeah, a female too, but like with a bruised face. Okay. So a female with a bruised face. Okay. So then that's like obvious signs of physical violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Sad and disappointed. Okay. What else? Hmm? A survivor, yeah. Somebody who has some like inner core strength, yeah. Okay, anyone else? Yes? She doesn't want to get out of the box. Okay, why doesn't she want to get out of the box? She's used to it. She's used to it, yeah, she's accustomed to it, yeah. Okay, so sometimes better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Okay, anyone else? So am 
I start calling on people? Because I think everybody has an idea in their head. When they say domestic violence survivor, a picture pops up. Okay. You had your hand up, yes. I think uh, one case that a domestic survivor could have is that after they get out, that if you spray shit, they're not sure what to do next. They're not sure, they're not sure what, what will come next for them and if they'll ever be able to heal. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it can get be so bad that it can be scarred permanently, mm -hmm. not only physically, but psychologically as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put out a few things and tell me if this fits your, like a picture, for whom this would be in your picture of domestic violence. Okay. Somebody who drinks a lot and when the abuser comes home basically breaks the, the abuser's nose. Is that hot for anybody? Okay. Um, that's one thing is that we normally don't associate people who are being abused as using physical violence. So who pictures the abuser using physical violence? Okay, so that's a few of you, yeah. Okay, but nobody pictures the, so one thing that also you see, and that is why sometimes, as you pointed out, um, the person who's abused gets arrested is sometimes they've actually used self-defense skills to keep themselves safer and wound up going to jail. Sometimes they knew they'd be going to jail because of it and they thought it would be their best bet. Sometimes they were very shocked when they found themselves in handcuffs. But in, in domestic violence, we call that the victim defendant. Somebody who at that time may thought their best choice was basically defending themselves physically, even if it could get them arrested. But when we think of a domestic violence survivor, often we think of somebody who's female, we think of somebody who's not going to be physically fighting back. We also tend to like our domestic violence survivors to be clean and sober. Okay? And we are not very happy when they talk back. And unfortunately, in real life, you don't get boxes to put people in. And the box for a domestic or an abuser, what would you say would be a, an abuser? Who's an abuser? Yeah. Men, okay. What else? A man with anger problems, okay? Yes? An alcoholic? Okay. A person on drugs, yeah, okay. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde. A Jekyll and Hyde, uh huh, yeah. So Jekyll and Hyde is basically somebody who, to everybody else, seems to be a really, really cool guy, really successful at what he does, good father, good professional, good community leader, and then at home he turns into a monster. Okay, I saw another hand up. Uh, football player. Football player. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? We've heard a lot about football players, haven't we? Okay, yes. I was going to say someone who is persuasive also in their actual relationship. And yeah. I met someone, this is going to happen again, or, you know, I'm sorry. Um, yes, so it's that cycle, okay, of abuse, that interesting little cycle there. Yes. One possibility is uh, that they could be the successful and uh, charismatic lawyer or businessman mm -hmm. who seems like a good guy, uh, charismatic, well, more than one, but deep down there's a, there's a sociopath or psychopath that comes from it that will hurt those that say it's a when they close doors. Yeah, so basically you're saying it's a very clever psychopath who realizes they're kind of a psychopath and has learned enough skills to mask themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yeah, that does happen. That's actually, psychopaths are actually considered only maybe 1% of the population. Yeah, and sociopaths are really like 4% like of the population. Yes, and unfortunately, the number of abusers are a little bit more than that. So, a, good, a segment of it are those people, but then we have to expand it to more. And I saw another hand up somewhere, yes. Oh, yeah, a person has Okay, 
So like maybe has a chip on their shoulder. Yeah. Walks around thinking other people owe them. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you're saying maybe it was learned behavior from when they were children? Yeah. Okay. Or maybe not only was it learned behavior, um, there's a, um, neuro a, a neuroscientist named Dr. James Fallon, not to be confused with Jimmy Fallon, the late night TV show host, okay, but Dr. James Fallon is a neuroscientist, and he has actually studied some of the genetics that goes into being a psychopath. And it's partly learned, but partly, he says, it's partly learned, but partly um, inherited. But the inherited part doesn't necessarily go on unless something happens in your childhood that triggers it. So that's kind of interesting. So if anyone wants to go to YouTube and look up Dr. James Fallon, it's a very entertaining video. We have several of them. I recommend the one he did for the moth. Okay. Um, so what we like to do, so you notice there's not a whole lot of overlap between the abuser box and the survivor box. So we don't need the box anymore. And the problem is in real life, it's a lot more messy. So you can have survivors, as you said, being carted off to jail for being seen as, you know, the primary instigator of the fight. Okay. And you can have um, abusers being just, you know, let go. So a couple of important things about abusers is that they do exhibit some things in advance. Okay, does anyone know what this is? It's a flag. And I heard somebody say over oh, here it's a red flag. Red flag, I mean something bad usually. Well, okay, a red flag. <laughs> well, it only means something bad if I hit you in the face. <laughs> but a red flag actually does not mean right off the bat. One red flag does not mean, oh my god, danger, danger, battle stations. Red alert, man the torpedoes. It's just sign of caution. Yes, a red flag basically means, oh, somebody just did something or said something that was really awkward in a creepy sort of way. Okay, somebody just pushed my boundaries and I didn't like it. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Let's see what else happened. And you basically want to see what else happens. So one of my former students, um, she was a massage therapist, and she said, you know, Joanne, we learned the exact same thing in massage school. Every time we're interviewing a new client, we, you know, we listen to what they say, and if they say something that makes us think to ourselves, hmm, we pay attention because three Hmm, equals one, oh. And maybe this is not going to be the client for you. And that's what I say also. If you are having an encounter with somebody and you see one red flag, and then a second red flag, and a third red flag, that's time to think of, okay, let's keep a little bit of distance from this person. You might want to think of your exit strategy, how you're going to like leave before it turns into a fight. Now, I've taught classes for women in abusive relationships for many years. And one thing I hear repeatedly over and over and over again is that it's the little red flags, the ones that people say, well, it's kind of annoying, it's kind of irritating, but you know, nobody's perfect, right? But you see enough of them, and they happen over and over again and you try to set boundaries, but then they escalate. And then it verges on getting to disrespectful. And if you see enough red flags, they are going to escalate. 
and they're going to increase in number, and they're going to increase in frequency. But it doesn't happen right away. It happens slowly over time. Okay, so the person, how many people here know somebody who either is or has been in an abusive relationship? Okay, it's not a whole lot of people, thank you. Um, I would make you a bet that even if you don't think you know someone who's been in an abusive relationship, I'll make you a bet a lot more of you actually do, but you just don't know it because they haven't told you about it. And that's actually pretty common. Because that's not something that a lot of people want to broadcast. So some abusers are very, like, vocal and they talk and they really don't want you to see other friends and they don't want you to associate with other people. One of my friends, um, okay, one of my former students, her friend just started dating him. She had been divorced for a few years and now she thought, I'm ready to begin dating again. So she met this guy and had gone on a few dates with him and she calls up my student and says, oh, this is so wonderful, it's a great relationship, he's such a good kisser. So. My, my student says, wonderful, that's great, why not you two come over to our house for dinner? So I can meet him, and he can, and you guys can meet my boyfriend. So they arrange a dinner date, and they come over. And right away, my student kind of feels a little edgy about this guy. And it starts off with, you know, she's talking to her friend, and the guy answers with the friend. So she says that the friend is an artist. She says, so what kind of projects are you working on now? And the guy, the new boyfriend answers. Is that a red flag? I tell you. Okay, so here's the thing about red flags. If it's maybe a red flag or a tiny bit red flag, yes, it's a red flag. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the red flag rule. If there's a reason for it to be a red flag, it's a red flag. Red flag, remember, does not mean, oh my god, I'm in imminent danger right now. A red flag means, okay, that's something I should watch for. Okay, so he is answering for her. And so my student is a little annoyed at that. And she asks, well, you know, are you, are you having any shows coming up? And the new boyfriend answers again. And then the new boyfriend says, yeah, and we're also working on, you know, changing her habits. Because she stays up late at night, I think she'd be more productive if she went to bed earlier and woke up earlier in the morning. Is that a red flag? Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody playing around with your schedule. You know, she hasn't hit her or anything like that. Um, and then my student says, you know, um, I'm trying to have a conversation with my friend here, and you keep answering. And then he says, well, you know, I have a vested interest in this. And he's a little defensive there. Is that a red flag? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this dinner does not go as swimmingly as they have wanted. And the next day, my, my student, who's a paralegal, goes into the office and does a little background check. And she, and then her friend calls her and says, yeah, you know, my new boyfriend didn't really like you and thinks you're not good for me, and doesn't think we should see each other again. That's a huge red flag right there. Some people would say that's a big red airplane banner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a big red flag. And my student said, yeah, you know what, let's meet for lunch. So she printed out a little file, and they met for lunch, and she gave the file to her friend and said, take a look at this. And in the file were restraining orders, related to domestic violence from last prior relationships, and his whole history on encounters with law enforcement. And they were not good. And she said, break up with him now, before it turns into a big headache. And her friend said, oh, he's such a good kisser. Break up with him now. And she did. And he, yeah, and he left a few notes for her around saying why there was a bad idea that they were breaking up, but then after a while he just drifted away. A lot of people, though, don't pay attention to those red flags 
or they don't have a friend who's a paralegal who does some background checking. Okay. And the way people get into abusive relationships is slowly over time. Okay, so who here, when you were a small child, thought to myself, when I grow up, I'm going to like have a totally awesome spouse. Okay. Who here thought when I grow up I'm in a stable full of horses and a unicorn just for me? Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So I do a lot of classes for teen girls, and what I ask them is something similar. I ask them, how many of you like went through a princess phase? And most of them raise their hand. So I say, okay, when you went through your princess phase, did you say, yeah, when I, I want my own Prince Charming, and I want a stable of horses, and I want a unicorn, and when I, when I go out into the yard, all the birds and squirrels come over to me, and they sing along with me. You know, right out of a Disney movie. And a lot of them are, are nodding, yeah, that sounds cool. And I say, and Prince Charming, goes out with his buddies every Friday and Saturday night, gets totally drunk, comes home and beats the crap out of you. Is that part of the princess fantasy also? Anyone? No. And none of us grew up with that. But that happens to about 30% of women, and nobody's quite sure what percent of men. And why does that happen? Basically, over time, the Prince Charming or Princess Charming, or let's just call them Charming, is, comes across, the abuser often comes across initially as very nice. Not only nice, but like super nice. Like, too good to be true. Like everything you always wanted in a potential mate. And they're awesome, and they think of you all the time, and there's breakfast in bed, and there's good coffee. Okay? And it's only over time, over a period of months, maybe even a couple of years, that the power and control starts becoming more and more obvious. Okay. So, and then sometimes people leave eventually. Sometimes people recognize the power and control, but sometimes people choose not to. It's the I don't want to know unknown. Sometimes it's the, even the I don't want to know, no, no. People say, yeah, I know this person does this, but they're not like that all the time, and sometimes they do it. Sometimes they yell at me for no reason, but they always apologize and bring roses. Or sometimes they just say, well, you know, hey, it's your fault. If you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had to do that. Okay? If you had picked up all the kids' Legos before I got home, then I wouldn't have had to punch the wall next to your head. So one thing that we do know is there's, um, does anyone know, has anyone heard of Dr. Paul Ekman? Okay, if you don't know who he is, you should take a look at some of his stuff. He's kind of considered the um, forerunner of lie detection facial expressions and stuff like that. Paul Ekman, very, very interesting guy. And Paul Ekman is the one who basically said that a lot of, it's not that people are bad at detecting lies that other people tell them, it's that they have a vested interest in believing the lie is not true. And it could be for your own psychological reasons you love that person, you minimize the amount of damage they're doing to you. It could be other people saying, well, he's really not that bad. So one time when I went for my annual wellness exam, I was talking with my primary care practitioner and she knows what I do for a living. I teach self-defense. And she mentioned that it seemed that a lot of people who were coming in to see her were in abusive relationships. And several of them were actually doctors. And I said, um, excuse me, Dr. Robbie, but aren't doctors trained to recognize domestic violence? And she said, yes, but it's harder to recognize it when it's happening to you, when you're in it. 
It's hard to recognize that situation. And there's also a lot of other factors connected to it. For example, there is a lot of people who believe that unless somebody hits you with a closed fist, it's not abuse. If they hit you with an open hand, not a big deal. Okay, as a self-defense teacher, I will tell you that it doesn't matter closed fist, open hand. If they hit you, they hit you. Okay, that's abuse. That's violence. Um, some people also have families who are pressuring people into staying in marriages. Some people come, have communities um, or have religious beliefs that basically say, you marry somebody, it's for better or for worse. And this might be worse, but you know what, you're married. So suck it up. So there's a whole bunch of different ways we think about domestic violence. Okay, so does domestic violence have to be physically violent? You say yes, raise your hand. No, it does not have to be physically violent. And there are some estimates that say that more abusive relationships are um, psychologically abusive. And the ones that are physically violent are more rare. But there's still a lot of them. Okay. And as, now I'm a self-defense teacher. So I get students in my classes who've been in abusive relationships. And then I get a lot of students in my classes who have never had any experience with violence at all in their lives. Okay. And it is really interesting when I talk to students because I teach a six week course including through the continuing ed program at the school. That, and I have a segment, I do a segment on domestic violence and it's really funny the reactions I get from people. Reactions I get from people who've been in abusive relationships are a lot of head nodding. I said, yeah, that's what happens. And then people who have not been in abusive relationships, very often the question I get is why are we learning about this? I am not at risk for domestic violence. And Raise your hand if you think you're not at risk for being in an abusive relationship. Okay. Anyone want to say why you're not at risk for being in an abusive relationship? Anyone care? Yes. Well, it's kind of, I don't know. I don't want to say it's kind of shame, but I mean, I'm married to a wonderful woman and have been for a while, so mm -hmm. I think yeah. I'm pretty safe. Yeah, and <laughs> you know what? If you were in, a, if you were in a um, long-term, non-abusive relationship right now, then the chances that it will stay that way are pretty good. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. And that basically is a risk. Now, domestic violence, one thing is that if you're in an abusive relationship when you're younger, you're more likely to repeat it when you're older. So, what do you do, how do we talk about domestic violence? And this brings us back to that um, football player, Frank Clark. So what should the Seahawks have done? Should they have said, oh, I guess we didn't do a good enough job investigating him. Let's, let's cut him loose. I don't think they did that. Okay. So now the director of Don, Ken Coleman, actually said, well, I'm not sure what they should do. I mean, they don't have to fire him because of that. And so what should they do with a player who had this, this little incident? And even though they said, well, we're not going to bring an abuser on board. Yes? Um, I think what they should have done is like get him into facility which would help him as to, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. help him understand why he was even doing that, mm -hmm. figure out what's the reason behind it. Maybe mm -hmm. he has like some brain injury or something that's causing him to just get angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, what I think. Mm -hmm. that's one possibility. I don't think they did that either. Um, yes? Uh, I think one of the possibilities they could have, now I wouldn't say they should just, it's just, Forget, we're not laying them on just yet. Uh -huh. We're not laying them on uh -huh. the slice. 
I think that after they go down to the more situation, I think he should at least be fined, may suspended, su suspended for like uh, several games, or a hack vegan may be required to take a uh, like, uh, anger management class mm -hmm. in the community service, and also a program mm -hmm. on the uh, dangerous and domestic violence. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna just I'm gonna throw in here something about anger management classes and domestic violence, and the two really don't mix very well. Once upon a time, some people used to say that, well, domestic violence is just like an anger issue, an anger problem. Send the guy to anger management or send the woman to anger management and domestic violence will go away. Did that happen? No. What tends to happen more, because here's the thing, is that most abusers actually can control their, their anger quite well and they use it as a weapon. So they, they choose when to be angry, they choose when to explore. Okay. And it's not so much a sense of they get angry. Okay, and here's another thing we tend to attribute and to abusers. It's a temper issue, it's an anger management issue. It's just they don't have the social skills. Maybe some of them don't, but a lot of them really do. Okay, and so they choose they're choosing to use it at a certain point in time. Okay. And what has happened from a whole bunch of abusers going through anger management. And there's one thing they've learned is how to present themselves better in court. They have, yes, a lot of them have basically learned how to play the system quite well. So anger management, eh. Not my first choice. Basically, we, a lot of us think that people are abusive because they get angry too quickly. And that's, that's a common stereotype of abusers. And a more common rationale for abusers, really, is the sense of entitlement they feel. Okay, they're entitled to a certain status, they're entitled to a certain level of um, servitude from somebody. Domestic violence has, begins when somebody looks at you not as a person, not as a partner, not as somebody I'm going to share my life with, but as a um, an object. When somebody is treating you like an object instead of like a person, that's probably the most important thing to realize about abusers. And we find it overall really hard to talk about domestic violence. We'd like to make it, well, why did she stay? Okay. Um, so, I want to do a little exercise. I need 11 intrepid people. <laughs> Only 11 intrepid people. Okay, I have one. What's intrepid? Um, brave. I need brave people. Okay. This is not going to be hard. All you have to do is read. Okay, if you know how to read and speak out loud, you are perfect for this role. We need seven more. Come on, we're here. Okay, so this is a really cool little exercise. And as a teacher, I like giving people skills. And this is a particular skill that will help you better deal with people in your lives who might be in abusive relationships. Okay, and it involves purple ribbon, so what could be bad about that? So, this is what I need. I would like, one person is going to be the abuser and the other person is the survivor. Who would like to be the abuser and who would like to be the survivor? So when I so I'll just give you so so so, so I can take away the stigma. When I learn this exercise, I play the abuser. Okay, so who wants to be the abuser? Want to try three first? Okay, so you can be the abuser. Who wants to be the survivor? Okay, you can be the survivor. Okay, so survivor, abuser, come on down here. Okay, let me have this. Survivor. Now you don't, you get this. So I get this. Okay. So just read your lines to yourselves right now. Okay, so hold this please. 
Now, everybody else is going to pick up a ribbon, okay? So, and then I'm going to give you, so grab a ribbon, and I'm going to give you one of these. And you'll notice you guys only have your prints on one side. Everyone else, you have a red side and a blue side. Okay, so you are going to be the friend. Okay? You are going to be a teacher. You're a teacher, yeah. So, grab a ribbon. Okay? Here, just grab this one. Okay? You've got a youth group leader. Okay. All right, so grab a ribbon. Okay? And. Would you like to be a school nurse? Awesome. There you go. New career. Okay. Would you like to be a, a boss? Okay. Yeah, let's get a little closer together so I can, like, get the answer. Okay. Would you like to be a school counselor? Okay. Okay. And you can be a parent. Okay. Would you like to be a coach? Okay, and you're going to be the sibling. Okay, so let's get these ribbons there. We got okay. little danglers down there. Okay, so sibling, you get a ribbon. Okay, so this is how this game works. And this is basically, you're going to have the red side and the blue side. So, the survivor is going to go to all of you people and ask for help. She goes, she, something happened and she doesn't know what to do. And first, so she's going to read her script. Then you guys are going to read, in order, the red side of your script. After you read the red side, you drop your ribbon. Okay? And then, that's when the abuser gets to say what he's thinking. Okay? So that's, that's round A. Okay? So this poor woman is coming to all of you fine, upstanding citizens for advice. So remember, red side first. Okay. What's happening in your life? No, you just tell everybody. Okay. So, my boyfriend screamed at me and shoved me against the wall last night. I don't know what to do. Okay, who are you? I'm the friend. And what are you going to tell her? I warned you about him, and I wish you had listened to me. You knew he was bad news even before this happened. I can't stand around and watch him do this to you. When you're ready to do something about your situation, let me know. Okay, drop your ribbon. Okay, who are you? I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. <laughs> you, you have made him your whole life. You need to expand your horizon and meet some new people. There are lots of great people out there. Okay, drop your ribbon. So you're just telling that person that, go meet some new people. Okay. I'm a youth group leader. I've seen the way you two, the two of you act around each other, and it really isn't healthy. I need to tell you that we can't have that kind of stuff going on in our youth group. <laughs> Who are you? I am a school nurse. Uh, I need you to calm down so I can help you. I, I know the relationships can be tough. Now tell me what happened that led up to the play. Okay. I'm your boss. I can't have you working here while you're so upset. Why don't you take some time off and call me when you can really focus on your job? <laughs> I'm your school counselor. How about if we call him and we can talk about it together? All of us. Let's try and help you two work this out. I'm your dad. <laughs> I told you I don't like him, and I don't want you seeing him anymore. You have to stay away from him. I'm the coach. What did you do to get yourself in that situation? I am spilling. Well, I can help you. You break up with him if you want to. And I'm getting pretty sick of just listening to the same problems over and over again. You should just end it, and I don't even know what you see in me anyway. Okay, so yes, now you are going to talk to your girlfriend. All righty then. I love you. I really need you. It won't happen again. If you stay with me, I'll get help. I care about you so much. I'm the one who's always here for you. Okay. So here's the thing, is the red side is what very well-meaning people are likely to say. You know what, now, you suddenly, we're in a different universe. So now you're going to go to the same people 
and they're going to give you sleep. So now, you're going to tell everyone what's happening with you, ask them for advice. Flip it over with the blue side, and as you, after you say your lines, pick up your ribbon, okay? So what's happening with you? All right, so my boyfriend screamed at me and shoved me against the wall last night, and I don't know what to do. You don't? So, who are you? Um, her friend. Okay, good. You don't deserve this. I really want to help you, and I'll just listen if you want. I'm here for you no matter what. Will you tell me more about what happened? Okay. That's a little different. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who are you? I'm her teacher. Teacher. This must be really hard for you. I noticed that you you trip from most of your friends, and you seem lonely lately. Do you have anyone else uh, you can talk to? Okay. Pick up a ribbon. Okay. I'm your youth group leader. I've noticed that your relationship seems more up and down lately, like a roller coaster. I hope you have some people to talk to about this. I can make suggestions if you'd like. Okay. Who are you? I'm the school nurse. No one has a right to treat you this way. I'm worried about your safety. Maybe together we can come up with some ways to help you feel better. Okay. Take a ribbon. Who are you? I'm your boss. I see that the stress of this relationship is affecting your work. Do you need some time off, or does being at work help you? I'm your school counselor. I really, I'm really glad you came to talk to me. You must have a lot of strength and courage to be getting through this. Can you tell me more about what's been going on? And I'm your dad. Are you all right? I'm so glad you came to talk to me because I've been really worried about you. It must be so confusing to have someone that you care about hurt. I'm your coach. I've seen other students in similar situations, and I know that it can be tough. I would recommend that you talk to someone about this. Do you want me to go with you to talk to the school counselor? I am split. It is, it is hard to know you have been going through this for so long, and it's really frustrating to see you like this. I know you have to handle this your own way, but I'm really worried about you. Is there anything I can do? Okay, I love you. I really need you. It won't happen again. If you stay with me, I'll get help. I care about you so much. I'm the one who's always here for you. Okay. So, two different universes. Two same sets of people, two different universes, though. So, when you heard the first round, and everyone dropped their ribbons, how were you thinking this person would be? Survivor blaming going on here. A little bit. Yeah, how did you guys, how did you feel reciting the red lines? Not very good. Didn't feel right. Didn't feel right? Okay. And how did you feel after seeing all the ribbons drop? I felt, well, to be honest with you, if I was in the abuser's perspective, I would feel like I was in control. Yep. That I had the power. Yep. That I had. I had some sort of status over her. Yep. The abuser's perspective. Not my perspective. Right. So, then the other way, the blue side. How did you feel when you, everyone said their blue lines and picked up the ribbon? I feel like the whole world was ready to help you when I needed help. Okay. How did you feel? I felt, oh boy. Mm -hmm. She has so many people that care about her, and I, there's this abuser who would build this jealousy inside yes. of her. And hatred inside of it. Yeah, users try to isolate their targets. When they're all alone. Yes. I have a comment on that. You know when everybody got the red side? Yeah. I feel like he had more power. He did. But then when the blue side got the red like he had it. Right. Yeah. And that's really important. So think about the differences between the red side and the blue side. So the red side is more like survivor blaming. Okay, and the second, and also telling the survivor what to do. You should do this, you should break up with him. The blue side was more like, yeah, this is tough. You have a lot of strength going, you know, going through this. I'm glad you're seeking help. I'm glad you're asking me, thank you. Um, what do you want to do? If you just want me to listen, that's fine. If you want us to come up with things together, that's fine. But I'm here for you. Okay, so that's the way 
we can all change and change the discourse around domestic violence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a hand up for you guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, 